Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to this afternoon's live stream here on Dream Bank's Facebook page. My name is Andy Frisky. I'm a senior dream curator. Really excited to introduce our featured speaker uh, that we have today. But before I do so, just want to welcome folks who may be tuning in for the first time and give them a little context as to who we are and why we are here. So Dream Bank is put on by American Family Insurance. And the whole reason why we exist is to help inspire people to pursue their dreams. And we're not under a pandemic. We operate in the heart of Madison, right on East Washington, but we host uh, right around 40 free events a month with 11, excuse me, eight different event series. So anything ranging from small business and entrepreneurial workshops to uh, career development activities. We host crafting series in our space, fitness related activities, family events, uh, just to name a few. So once you're done with the stream today, I highly encourage you to kind of comb through some of the other events that we've had. We've been putting them out since uh, since about March 17th. So um, we have a good catalog of a wider range of various topics. Um, but I'd like to go ahead and uh, kick it over to our featured presenter today, Percy Brown. He's going to be talking about recru recruitment and hiring and retention uh, for our diverse staff. Percy, go ahead and take it away. Andy, thank you for the, the warm introduction. Good afternoon, people uh, that are tuning in live stream. My name is Percy Brown, Jr. Uh, I was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, a proud graduate of Madison West. Yes, I am a bona fide regent. Uh, but just to share a little bit about myself, uh, I've been in education now for 17 years. I've been serving youth across Dane County in various capacities for over 20 years. Uh, currently in my ninth year as the Director of Equity and Student Achievement for the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District. And I also work, work part-time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Wisconsin Center for Education Research. And lastly, I am also a CEO of my own education consulting firm. So I have a lot of irons in the fire, uh, but I do believe that the work that I do is uh, really grounded and foundational in being a, a servant leader uh, and really doing all that I can to ensure that, uh, you know, not only the Madison community, but the Dane County community, but the American family community uh, can be one that it lives under this idea of the beloved community, which is really uh, work that Dr. King was embarking on towards the end of his life. Uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, Andrew and I, we uh, we had conversations months ago about partnering and, and doing a webinar for the business community with a focus on recruitment, hiring and retention of a diverse staff. Uh, and, and when we set the date, we did not realize that it would be the day of the presidential election. So happy election day to you. And I've got to be honest with you, uh, the, the description that was sent out in terms of really trying to connect these ideas around why it's important to uh, consider recruiting, hiring and, and retaining a diverse staff uh, as it relates to the global economy and understanding that our world is so diverse, uh, I think is important. Right. Uh, but I've got to shift gears just a little bit, given that this is our election day. And there are so many things that confront us as a nation. And there are things that have been highly politicized um, in our nation leading up to today. And, and of course, uh, a few of those things are COVID-19. We have a teetering economy where there are millions of people out of work. Uh, our business community is still relying on another wave of pandemic relief from our federal government. And, and we've got social unrest uh, that's really a result of ongoing racial injustice in this nation. Uh, so rather than talking about recruitment, hiring and retention of a diverse staff from the perspective of why it's important considering this global economy that we live in, uh, I, I want us to, to get grounded in, in the moral imperative. Uh, I think there's also a moral imperative when organizations need to consider the recruitment, hiring and retention of a diverse staff. And because issues of race are so front and center in our nation today, I just uh, wanted to really get us grounded in that as we have this uh, opportunity to learn, but then uh, go back and forth because the chat will be open for you to ask questions. Andrew will be paying attention to that. And this will be interactive in the sense that as I'm going through my presentation, uh, I will be pausing for moments uh, where you all will have an opportunity to drop answers to some questions that I have into the chat 
And I just think, uh, you know, in this virtual space, it's important to keep it interactive and, and me not talking at you for 90 minutes to two hours. So I think is my screen ready to go with the show, Andrew? You are all ready. Yep. OK, so do I just expand that screen? For some reason, I'm not seeing my clicker. Just got to make sure that you're in the, the tab. Oh, the wrong, there we go. I'm so used to Zoom. I am so <laughs> sorry, good people that are okay. on the other end. So here we go. The recruitment, hiring, and retention of a diverse staff. So let's uh, start with some introductions. So if you can drop in the chat, uh, what industry are you currently working in? Uh, what is bringing you here this afternoon? And if you do represent uh, a business or an organization, uh, and if you know this offhand, please drop this in the chat. What are the employee demographics of your organization when disaggregated by gender and race? So if you can respond to all three or one of the three or two of the three uh, for Andrew to be able to respond, uh, I greatly appreciate it. So it looks like Humane Society um, is, is one that's coming in, um, mostly uh, white women. Martial arts, uh, the gender is about 50-50. Healthcare IT. Okay. I don't know if we lost you, Andrew. No, oh, I'm still here. Oh, there you go. UTI Professional Services. Nice. All right, thank you all for dropping that into the chat. So our essential questions for today, uh, these will be uh, the things that I'll be responding to uh, as we engage in this opportunity with one another. So how has legislation, policy, and belief systems in the United States contributed to people of color, but particularly Black Americans experiencing discrimination in hiring practices? And in what ways do people of color, but particularly black Americans, experience barriers that prevent them from equal access to employment opportunities? And lastly, what can the business sector do to improve its practices in the recruitment, hiring and retention of a diverse staff? So I just want to go ahead and, and, and briefly uh, introduce race in, into the space, because race is something that has been really funky in America now for hundreds of years, but a lot of people uh, have come to understand race in a way that we really need to consider stepping away from that and rethinking what race is really all about in America. So as you can see right here, there's a, a visual uh, of human beings and also an animal that represents the chimpanzee family. But this illustration right here uh, is a visual from science that was developed in the mid 1700s in Europe by scientists such as Johann Blumenbach and Carolus Linnaeus. They initially were uh, scientists who studied plants, but then shifted gears and really wanted to start studying the human family. And as they were studying the human family, they truly believed that there was a hierarchy within our family uh, in, in terms of there being a, an intellectual superior within the human family or within the human family, there was uh, a part of that family that was closely connected to God, right? And if that, and from that superior race, uh, any offshoot of that would be a degenerate from that original type that would be the intellectually superior and that most closest to God. This science was based on skin color and physical characteristics. And obviously if this science was being developed in Europe, uh, they would obviously place themselves at the top of the human family. And when you consider who would be the opposite in terms of skin color and physical characteristics, it would be those of African descent. So this science, uh, unfortunately, was bad science. Uh, when we think about 21st century science today around genetics or DNA, it's clear that uh, the human family, regardless of physical characteristics or skin color, have 99.9% .9 of the same DNA. So we've been operating uh, for quite some time off of bad science. 
And as this science was being developed in Europe, it did take shape in terms of the formation of what we would call the United States of America. And a couple of examples of this is uh, Thomas Jefferson prior to uh, the Constitution being drafted or even the Declaration of Independence. He, he wrote his notes on Virginia and this is what he had to say, quote, I advanced it therefore as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by circumstance are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. Now, if you truly understand African history or uh, ancient Kemet or what we would call ancient Egypt, uh, to know that history is to understand that this, what Thomas Jefferson was putting into the space was untrue. Unfortunately, this was even followed with our 16th president of the United States of America, Abraham Lincoln, our great emancipator. In 1858, when he was debating Stephen Douglas for the U.S. Senate, he said, I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There is physical difference between the two, which, in my judgment, will probably forever forbid their living together upon the equal footing of perfect equality. So it's quite obvious that this science, which they call the great chain of being, did take shape and was of the mindset of a lot of our political leaders. I just referenced two presidents of the United States of America. Thomas Jefferson was responsible for drafting the Declaration of Independence and also signed the U.S. Constitution. So when we think about that mindset taking shape in the United States of America, we now have to consider what that looked like along the lines of, of policy and legislation. But again, uh, even in the 21st century, and this is just an image of media to get us to really start thinking about the power of information, uh, the power of, of visual imaging, as we will get into how implicit bias impacts the recruitment, hiring, and retention of a diverse staff. We have our most celebrated basketball player right here, LeBron James, on the cover of Vogue magazine uh, with a pretty white woman. But if we put that right next to the image of the King Kong movie poster when it was released, uh, you see a lot of commonalities. And while this may be subtle and not in your face, this is reflective of that science that was developed in the mid 1700s and unfortunately made its way into the United States of America. So let's talk about how this took shape in terms of policy and legislation. And I don't really have to touch on slavery other than uh, it was 246 years of free labor uh, that was never repaid. And in today's dollars, uh, that labor has a dollar amount of anywhere between 10 and 20 trillion dollars. And I just want to want you to keep that in the back of your mind. But in 1896 or 1892, actually, the decision was uh, made in 1896. The U.S. Supreme Court took on the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. And that case stemmed from an 1892 incident in which a black American train passenger, Homie Plessy, refused to sit in the car for blacks. So the United States Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine. So right now, as you kind of reflect on that science and you think about how even after slavery with the U.S. Supreme Court uh, basically saying it's constitutional for our society to be separate but equal, uh, as you think about hiring practices, in what ways do you think the Plessy decision influenced racial discrimination in hiring practices in the late 19th century? So just go ahead and, and just drop whatever comes to mind uh, in the chat and just know that this is not a, a right or a wrong answer. I, I'm not testing you to give you a letter grade, even though I'm an educator, uh, but I just kind of want to see where your thinking is right now. So in what ways did the Plessy decision influence racial discrimination in hiring practices? Do we have anything coming in the chat or is that a really tough question? And you can say it's a really tough question in the chat too. <laughs> Not, nothing yet. There might be just a, a slight delay while people are typing. So we give it a few more here. Okay. Yeah, no worries. And I can always provide a little more information. So, you know, what this did was really create 
uh, social distancing by law. So we all are, are uh, being asked to engage in social distancing. But uh, think about this in the terms of social distancing by law, where uh, if you were a black American, you weren't able to shop in certain stores. You weren't able to eat in certain restaurants. Uh, oftentimes, if you were to order food from a restaurant, you would have to go to the back door to get it. Uh, and if you just think about those things, uh, how could that influence discrimination in hiring practices if separate but equal was constitutional? And if nothing comes up, that's totally fine, but hopefully that's uh, pricking your mind a little bit to think critically uh, about our history as I will continue to move forward. So what we have to do in America now is not look at race as a biological construct, because if we do, then it's going to be very difficult for us to not align ourselves to the great chain of being, uh, because there is nothing biological about you and I in terms of, of race. So what we have to do is really think about race as a social engineering experiment in the United States of America. Race in the United States is a social construct that determines the political, economic, and social rights of its citizens based on skin color and physical characteristics. And I think that this is reinforced in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. So when we think about that mindset, the, the separate but equal, and now we localize it right here in Madison, Wisconsin, or the greater Dane County area, when we think about hiring practices, or if we're looking within our organizations and, and we don't see diversity reflected, uh, especially along racial lines, we just have to really think about what are those things that could have prevented that from happening or why do we continue to see lack of diversity in our organizations today. Uh, but when we think about racial inequality or racial discrimination, we have to look back into our history and oftentimes when we're thinking about racism, whether it's structural, individual, or institutional, we think it was always held in the South. Uh, but right here in Dane County, it was pervasive uh, in the early 20th century. You see right here at UW-Madison in 1923, there was a chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, even on King Street, 1924, a year later, you had a huge Ku Klux Klan rally. So there was a pretty solid presence uh, of Ku Klux Klan activity in the Madison area. Uh, the only difference between the, the Ku Klux Klan here in Madison compared to the Ku Klux Klan in the South is that they were not uh, advocates of, of racial violence, but they were strong advocates of ensuring that uh, all good job paying uh, positions or, or certain communities uh, really maintained a sense of, of whiteness and, and really not creating opportunities for people of color, but primarily black Americans uh, because of that mindset of us being inferior. Which now leads me to a little bit more in uh, down the road, building off of Plessy versus Ferguson. So here we have in the, in the 1930s, uh, President FDR, uh, was in the midst of the Great Depression, and he established the Federal Housing Authority. Uh, but this particular effort right here uh, furthered the segregation efforts by refusing to insure mortgages in and near Black American communities, a policy known as redlining. So what happened was the federal government backed billions of dollars of low interest rate home loans uh, in order for uh, suburbs to be built, right? This was, this was now a way for the middle class to be established this was a way for white Americans to be able to establish wealth by way of home ownership. And these communities, as they were designed, were restricted to white Americans only and black Americans were not afforded not only the, the low interest rate funding from the government, but they were also not allowed to move into those green highlighted communities. So at the same time, the Federal Housing Authority was also subsidizing builders who were mass producing entire, entire subdivisions for white Americans with the requirement that none of the homes be sold to blacks. And, you know, again, oftentimes when we're having conversations about race, people will think that it was only placed 
in the South. And, and let's just think about this, uh, you know, pr mass producing subdivisions. Right. So the federal government was subsidizing builders who got those contracts. Uh, and then whoever got the contracts, who were getting the subcontracting jobs. Uh, I think if you consider Plessy versus Ferguson and, and what was happening here with redlining, uh, it should be obvious to think about who held those jobs and who weren't able to get those jobs. So redlining, this is redlining right here in Madison, Wisconsin in the 1930s. And again, I want you to really think about this as it relates to hiring practices. Um, because if we have the Supreme Court saying that separate but equal is constitutional, and then across the United States of America, we are designing cities and neighborhoods in ways that are racially segregated, that is going to impact public schools. That is going to impact uh, economic well-being, uh, but it's also going to impact employment opportunities. So here we have in Madison, Wisconsin, this is actually a map, I believe, in 1937. So any area that you see highlighted in green uh, were deemed to be your most desirable neighborhoods. Uh, whether it was local, state, or federal laws, these green line communities intentionally had higher property values and strong tax bases. Uh, and then, you know, they would receive an A rating, but then the blue neighborhoods would be considered your blue rating uh, or your B graded neighborhood. And I think blue right here in Madison, Wisconsin could be sections of UW Madison. So then your yellow highlighted communities uh, had a letter grade of C and then your red line communities had the lowest grading possible of a D. These red line communities oftentimes were labeled as your least desirable neighborhoods had uh, buzzwords like uh, criminality, uh, thuggery and, and, and other negative terms associated with these neighborhoods. And it was these red line neighborhoods that were restricted to black Americans only. Uh, and again, at the local, state and federal level, uh, these neighborhoods that were red line intentionally had lower property values and tax bases. And prior to Brown, that created an unequal school system. So this history of, of, of structural racism, uh, you know, along the lines of redlining, uh, a mindset of, of white supremacy, uh, you know, whether it was at UW Madison with the Ku Klux Klan chapter or even Klan rallies happening in Madison, is something that we have to acknowledge. And, and, and something that I really wanted to bring into the space when we really think about the moral imperative as organizations to look at what we have and then figure out ways to be able to diversify if we haven't done so. M. Robinson, a uh, PhD who, who did her dissertation on black life in Madison, uh, you know, came up with this, and I really wanted to bring this into the space. So Wisconsin never countenanced de jure segregation, which is segregation by law, but de facto segregation and discrimination was common, and de facto is voluntary segregation. So you had uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, if you just reflect back on the map, there were 14 restrictive realtor covenants around the Madison, Monona, and Middleton areas, and what that meant was that in those covenants, it explicitly said that to be black meant that you were excluded from living in those neighborhoods. Uh, you know, one example of Madison is actually Nakoma. Uh, but Robert C. Weaver goes on to say intense resistance to the concept of a Negro neighbor was usually concentrated in given neighborhoods. It became widespread only after the professional advocates of enforced racial segregation has spent much time and money to propagandize its necessity and desirability. So if there was a concerted effort to ensure that people, uh, American people, did not live together simply because of, of skin color, uh, we've got to safely assume that that would impact hiring practices because those who were in positions of power and had the authority to hire primarily during that time period in Madison were white. So the consequences today, and we got to, and then now I'm about to lead into what things look like today around hiring practices. People of color are often concentrated in neighborhoods that have frequently been disempowered, both politically and financially, and we can connect that to hiring. Lower property values, as I've talked about, in neighborhoods of color makes land cheaper for industrial actors to purchase. So now you have communities of color that are 
in close proximity to toxins that are being released in the neighborhood, uh, which contributes to hypertension and diabetes. And that is something in which black Americans are disproportionate in terms of looking at it across America. But a lot of people don't oftentimes make that connection to the environmental impact from being restricted to living to red line communities. Uh, I talked about lower property values and taxes negatively affecting public school funding, which again contributes to hiring practices in terms of preparedness and having the skills and tools to compete for those jobs. And then policy choices alongside financial reasons drives these decisions to protect wealthier, whiter neighborhoods. And then all of this uh, tremendously contributes to the racial wealth gap and political inequality. So in the chat, when you think about hiring practices, uh, in what ways did redlining contribute to racial discrimination and employment opportunities? So if you were listening to me, I, I'm sure I dropped a few hints out there at you. So hopefully um, we'll get a few responses in the chat and then I'll kind of shift gears and really focus on the recruitment, hiring and retention of a diverse staff in the 21st century. While we're waiting for some of those folks to go ahead and type the responses, Rita um, passed along a, a nice comment stating that The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein is a very enlightening book. Yes, that is a powerful book. It really lays out uh, how our communities were established across the nation. And, and even today, uh, the United States is just as racially segregated in housing as it was in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and, and housing, you know, is about communities. And, and if we're racially segregated, you know, how are we truly in community with one, and, you know, with one another in ways where we're going to make sure uh, that people along racial lines are having opportunities uh, for, for decent employment uh, or ensuring that all children are receiving a, a high quality education and some of those things have been addressed you know in 1954 we had the brown decision which desegregated schools uh, but when we think about economics a lot of folks don't under uh, don't realize the unintended consequences of that or don't realize that in 1954 as the brown decision was happening the u.s department of commerce released a documentary as the nation was starting to desegregate and really encouraging black business, I mean, white businesses, white business owners to open up their doors to black Americans. Uh, and the reason why is because in 1954, we had $15 billion of annual spending power, but because of racial segregation, we had to rely on our own businesses, uh, which we had to create because we were not allowed to shop or eat in certain stores or restaurants. Again, social distancing, by law, uh, which was in place for decades, but the unintended consequences of that, right, which again gets to hiring practices. Uh, so American businesses opened up their doors, Woolworths opened up their doors, J.C. Penney's opened up their doors, Sears opened up their doors, uh, white schools opened up their doors for, for integration. So in education, for example, as black children were starting to be integrated into white schools, black schools closed. But we know that as black children were being integrated into white schools, black teachers were not being hired into those white schools. So there were tens of thousands of black teachers that lost their jobs, which has generational impact because if you have children that you're raising and they wanna consider education, but you know you were just not, you know, you lost your job and you're not being hired in a white school, you're gonna discourage your child from pursuing that profession. And then as far as the business community, uh, as soon as those doors opened, uh, we shopped and our black stores closed. And what happened with that was we're in a dynamic now as black Americans where collectively we have one point two trillion dollars of annual spending power. Unfortunately, we are con we're consumer heavy. So we're a consumer based people when it comes to how we spend our money. And because we're not spending in stores within our own communities, we're spending with organizations that have not hired us. And now we're in a dynamic where the dollar in the black community only circulates for six hours before it leaves. Whereas other racial groups, the dollar stays in the community for days. 
Uh, so that financial, you know, dynamic where we were willing to come into the stores and shop, but those uh, predominantly white institutions or stores did not hire us. So in some ways, we ended up in a lose lose situation when it comes down to uh, employment opportunities. So I just wanted to lay that out. Was there anything else that came up in the chat? Absolutely. Yeah. You touched on a few of these, but uh, I'll just kind of read them off quickly here. Less access to job openings, less access to the education uh, need to, com to compete for jobs, not able to get places of employment due to where someone lives based on their address, ease of transportation between places where people live and where the opportunities are. Um, you know, people own, are applying where they can get to. So again, tied to transportations, uh, yeah. screenings based on the home addresses, union uh, memberships. So lots of. Uh, yeah, people, people are chiming in with some powerful stuff. And, you know, I don't know if you all know where Ally Drive is, if you're from the Madison area. Um, it, if you know, it's a it's a it's a community of color. Uh, there is poverty in that community. But, you know, 20 years ago, there used to be a grocery store, Cubs Foods across Verona Road. Uh, there was a Walgreens there. There was, I think, a, a small healthcare clinic there. So they had some things, but if you drive by there today, they've just renovated the highway where they've truly sealed that community in. There's no grocery store in close proximity to that neighborhood. Walgreens is no longer there uh i mean transportation madison metro it, it's a complex system so you know there are things that are happening structurally that are really keeping uh you know people of color or even people in poverty um you know basically in prison in ways where it's it's just so difficult for them to be able to access these opportunities uh so it's real but we have to have a commitment to be able to acknowledge it for what it is and think outside of the box uh, to really move towards solutions, because I do believe that we have the resources in this community as long as we have, um, you know, participation from the private sector and the public sector working together to really confront these issues in its uh, reality. So I'll keep rolling about hiring practices today. And I just want to focus on implicit bias. So implicit bias. The definition is the attitudes or stereotypes that are, affect our understanding, actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness of intentional control. And I think this is so important today because I do believe in America we have made racial progress. And I do believe that uh, in terms of our conscious ways of thinking uh, the majority of uh, of Americans, regardless of race, uh, believe that we have egalitarian beliefs about one another. Uh, but, you know, there is that unconscious mind that is uh, equally, if not more powerful, that oftentimes drives our actions and decision makings without us even being aware of it. And when I, you know, you think about, um, the messaging or things that we've learned in school or haven't learned in school about certain groups of people, or if you pay attention to the media in terms of how certain groups are being portrayed. I mean, just think about, you know, black Americans and even in this presidential election, uh, you know, the, the, the war on drugs keeps coming up. And then that label of super predators uh, just truly being bombarded on black males, you know, in the eighties, nineties, and even into the early two thousands is a real thing uh, because I heard it night in and night out on the news, but that unconscious mind is so powerful. So now, you know, this is gonna be a real cool activity. So in the chat, I want you to just uh, throw in there any stereotypes that come to mind for you when it comes to men. So what are some stereotypes that surface for you about men? So go ahead and throw those into the chat. I'll kind of kick off and just help start the dialogue. But I think the first thing that comes to me, mind for me, is the machismo mentality, the masculine. They need to yeah. you know, kind of look like that carved from marble type of type of look, you know, so strong, yep. masculine. Yep. Adam uh, comments, aggressive, aggressive, can express emotions. Mm -hmm. There you go. 
So how about women? What are some stereotypes that come to mind for you about women? I think just on the flip side too is the 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 need to be you know overtly um, feminine, the dainty. You know, I have um, my mom right now is here helping you know install some cabinets she built. So obviously we know that those stereotypes don't hold true, but uh, those are some that that that, uh, that 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 come to mind initially. Mom, Doug, Doug uh, commented, you know. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. He just commented one word. So maybe the need to be a mother or, or a, a mom. Okay. Emotional, sensitive, nurturing. All right. All right. It's coming out. So what you have here are uh, the most commonly held stereotypes about women and men. And these are labels that sometimes draw, you know, drive how we see certain groups of people. Some, I mean, this is about gender. Uh, and, and some of you all were spot on with some of those stereotypes. And, and where do those stereotypes come from? How do we come to know about these stereotypes? And how often do we label, uh, you know, if you're a man, how often do you label a woman uh, as being, you know, supportive or, or nurturing or she's a bad driver, but then on the flip side, you know, Men always have to come off as, as strong or machismo or, or, or tough and that we have to be independent and competitive. Uh, think about these things because, you know, although we always say we have egalitarian beliefs, these stereotypes are what drives our implicit biases. Uh, you know, one stereotype about women that's not on there is that they're not good in science and math. And that plays out in public schools so much where that stereotype, whether somewhere funky in the system or even within some of our young females' minds, they don't think that they should be in AP science and math classes. But we're aware of that based on what we're learning from educational research. And we want to make sure that we're dismantling that barrier so that our young women can, uh, you know, feel confident and participate in our advanced placement math and science classes. So this is what it looks like as far as gender. But this is what we have in terms of the most commonly held stereotypes today for a uh, black American or white American. And when you think about this in relationship to hiring practices, if you are not in community or you don't have genuine or authentic relationships with groups of people across racial lines, right? Like, let's say we have uh, some white folks that are part of a hiring committee and they're dealing with black applicants, but they've never been around black people, which can be in some cases. Uh, more than likely, you know, these can be the things in their unconscious mind that might be driving them to decide to not give that black applicant a candidate, even though the resume could be exactly the same as a white candidate. And vice versa, uh, if there are black Americans who have never been in community with white Americans or or don't have authentic or genuine relationships, uh, they can easily, you know, draw this broad generalization about all white Americans and, and allow those stereotypes to drive uh, how they see them. Sometimes it's conscious. Uh, sometimes they may, you know, say, I don't think that way about any group of people, but unconsciously those stereotypes are there because of conversations that may have been held in the home when they were growing up, things that they may have learned uh, in the neighborhood or things that they may have learned in the church or just uh, around certain groups of people that they may have been around, right? Just think about uh, the fact that, you know, we have uh, white nationalists and, and neo-Nazis. And this doesn't even have to be about stereotypes, but uh, some of these things right here, they truly believe black Americans are. and you know, to make that connection to what we saw in Madison in the 1920s, uh, you know, whether there's been a, a conscious shift from white superiority to egalitarian beliefs, there's still a lot in between that I think still sits in the unconscious mind. So, you know, to kind of make a connection between stereotypes uh, and research around hiring practices, uh, MIT and the University of Chicago conducted a study 
in 2003 to identify whether hidden biases play a role in the hiring process. Uh, so what they did was that they put 5,000 resumes uh, out in the space in the Boston and Chicago area land. Uh, the resumes were exactly the same in terms of credentials and skills. The only thing that was different uh, were the names that were assigned to the resumes. And um, they applied stereotypical black sounding names and stereotypical white sounding names. And what the study concluded was that white sounding names received 50% more interview invitations than black sounding names. So that's the initial screening process right there. And just based on the name, although the qualifications and the skills were exactly the same, half of the black applicants got a call back for the initial job interview. So this is just one way in which, uh, you know, implicit bias or, or stereotypes working in, in connection with each other can prevent uh, employment opportunities for people of color. So I've got uh, just another quick activity for you, right? Let's say you're part of a hiring committee and you've just gone through um, interviewing about seven candidates and you're in the debriefing session and you're the you're the first round and uh, you've ranked the candidates and then you're trying to decide uh, who you want to move forward uh, to the final interview. So, you know, the lowest score is actually the highest rank. So candidate A was the strongest candidate. Candidate B uh, was next in line and then candidate C. And, you know, everybody had strong qualities. So if you were in this position, just given the scores, who would you move forward into the final round? And these are your top three candidates out of about eight or nine. Who would you move to the final round? So looks like Adam says A, candidate A. Just A? That's what we have so far, yep. Okay. What would you do, Andrew? If the lowest score is the, uh, the highest rank, I mean, it appears to me that 23 would be ranking. It's uh, here, we've got some comments coming in too. Uh, I want more information. Uh, a appears to have the best score. Um, another comment. This doesn't seem to be enough information. This is just one piece of the puzzle. Just one piece of the puzzle. Then okay. someone has also said all three. All three. If Can these are your highest, if these are your Can highest. Someone explain why they would move all three forward. So we'll give it a couple more moments here. Let's see if that person will elaborate as to why they would choose all three. Yeah. So Becky asked, what were the criteria for the rankings? Uh, we took notes on each of our questions and then there was a rubric that guided our uh, final score. And then we just compiled those scores uh, and it was a group of about five or six people. So I'll add another layer to this. So candidate A is Southeast Asian and candidates B and C are white candidates but the people that were part of the panel were predominantly white and there was discussion about moving all three forward rather than one So Doug, um, if it's out of eight or nine, that's the top third, plus two and three are so, so close. But one stands out, right? So if you were an organization to that person said that they said they would move all three. Now that you know that candidate A is a person of color. And when you look at your, your organization, there is a commitment to diversifying. Would you still move all three?
just so that um, to make sure that everybody was able to get that on the stream. Can you just repeat that that second part again for us, Percy, please? So candidate A is a person of color. Candidate B and C are white. And you're in an organization that is committed to diversifying its staff. Would you still want to move all three forward? So we've got one response so far that says no. Okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and add uh, some more context to the story. Actually, I, I, was, I was part of this process um, and there was one other person of color that was part of the process and the other six or seven panelists uh, were white and the hire was actually going to supervise um, the white folks that were part of the panel. And there was a lot of dialogue going back and forth uh, in terms of who we should move forward and who we shouldn't move forward. Uh, and this is an organization that is committed to diversifying its staff. Uh, but for the folks that were going to be supervised by this hire, uh, we're, we're very strong in, in terms of wanting to push all three candidates forward. Uh, but when I see a situation like this, where you're really not hiring because of someone's skin color, you're hiring somebody because they're clearly the top candidate at this in that first nine. I mean, you know, almost double. Right. And if you're an organization that's committed to diversifying the right thing to do is to really just move candidate A forward and leave the other two behind. Uh, because sometimes if you move all three, they may not make it to the end because when we hire, we do hire for things that may not necessarily be about talent or skill. Um, sometimes we hire unconsciously because of comfort or because of how they may fit in or how she may fit in to the organization, right? If you think about education, you know, sometimes, you know, schools are, are looking to hire somebody that, that reflects the makeup of their district or, or is a good fit. And if the district is predominantly white and you're a candidate of color, you might not fit some of that criteria. And your talent and your skills may not be able to supersede that, right? Um, so here there, there was some some, you know, really uh, deep and engaging dialogue. And I, you know, just flipped the script and said, you know, well, what if uh, candidate A were white and candidate B and C were candidates of color? Would we really be trying to move all three forward? And I said, just think about all the, the learning that we've been doing in this organization for several years and just think about the history. Uh, and when that perspective was shared, uh, there was consensus where it was like, we've got to move that person forward. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about hiring, first, you've got to make sure that you don't have screening processes um, that align to that research study that I showed you. So you have to make sure that, you know, if your organization is is committed and has intentionality you know you're just going to be looking even harder um to make sure that you're you're capturing candidates of color but then when you get into you know the rounds of interviews uh it's always a great idea if you can to have you know diversity of thought on that panel so it should be a blend of of gender it should be a blend of of racial uh, makeup if you have that it should be a blend of, of people in terms of how they're situated in your organization. You know, it doesn't always just have to be uh, the CEOs or the managers that are part of the hiring panels. You know, uh, 
use your your organizational chart you know vertically and 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 bring in you know different groups of people because they offer perspective they don't have to you know deeply understand you know what everything about the job is going to entail but there's also the human factor that needs to be considered and when we have you know different groups of people around that space it really does create the conditions for us to hire the strongest candidate So I just want to spend a few minutes on 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 what uh, I've been able to accomplish in Middleton. Um, you know, it's a predominantly white institution. I started there as a dean of students at Middleton High School in 2012, and because I started doing work around issues of diver diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, created the position that I'm in now, and I am uh, in year seven of that role. Uh, but I just want to share, you know, some of the successes and, and the work that we have to do uh, as a public school district goes beyond just uh, diversifying our staff. Uh, you know, we have to provide professional development to, to help our teachers become more culturally responsive in the classroom. Uh, we have to focus on ensuring that, you know, our most historically disenfranchised students are, are reading at grade level. Uh, and are graduating on time, you know, prepared for the 21st century. So there are a lot of things that uh, we're, we're tackling all at once, uh, which lets me know that, you know, if the business sector is committed, uh, you can make some things happen for yourself because uh, the work isn't as complex other than, you know, having to focus on hiring, but then ensuring that, you know, you're, you're providing spaces uh, for your culture and climate to embrace a, a diverse group of, of staff. So in Middleton, what really got us grounded in the work uh, was a lot of information gathering. So we grounded ourselves in educational research. Uh, we extended to our stakeholders to learn more about our communities that needed our support. Uh, we empowered the student voice. And, and in doing all of that, uh, we've, we've created robust professional development. So we are constantly educating ourselves uh, to be able to improve our system around issues of, of race, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are uh, highly committed and intentional in the work that we do. Uh, and again, it goes beyond just looking at racial demographics when you're thinking about diversifying your organization. Uh, geographical region is important. Gender is important. Uh, ensuring that you know folks who may have, uh, who identify with disabilities uh, are important to be into the space, our LGBTQ trans community, the more that you can have multiple perspectives, that truly does enrich in your organization. But just in Middleton, uh, when I started in 2012, uh, our senior leadership team, so the superintendent, our deputy uh, superintendent and assistant superintendent were all males. They were all white males. Uh, less than 10 years later, all three of those positions are occupied by women. At the district level, uh, I didn't include myself on this, but our student services director, our director of elementary education, our business services director, um, once again in 2012 were held by all white men, are now held by people of color. Uh, student services, we have a Filipina woman that is in leadership in that role. Our director of elementary education uh, is a black male and our director of business services is a Southeast Asian American male. Uh, again, uh, positions that have totally flipped at the building level. Crimery Middle School and Northside Elementary School were positions that were once held by white men. Uh, Crimery Middle School, uh, our head principal is a black male in Northside Elementary. We have a Southeast Asian male in leadership. Uh, and even at the high school for the first time, uh, our athletic director at Middleton High School, that position has typically been held uh, by white males, uh, God rest his soul. Bob Joers was our previous uh, athletic director. We lost him by way of, of death, uh, but that opportunity uh, presented itself and we've now hired our first um, black male athletic director. So when you think about uh, our leadership level from senior leadership all the way to the building level, uh, we are a group of people uh, that represents a group that have somewhat been historically disenfranchised. Uh, and we are more diverse than we've ever been. Uh, and, and I can look back at 2012. So 
at that level, you know, staff of color and, and the leadership level. Uh, when I stepped in as the first in 2014, I made up a whopping 3%, but now we're well over 30%. And as far as overall staff uh, in, in less than five years or in five years, we've gone from 2% staff of color to 16% staff of color. Uh, we are still struggling, however, um, in terms of hiring more staff of color at the teaching level, but that really, uh, there are a lot of issues there that are outside of our control, although we've really been working hard to, to deal with that. Uh, you know, the Department of Public Instruction has some things in place that creates barriers for, um, you know, future educators of color from getting their teaching license. But we've been working on that. We also have a Grow Your Own program where we are building our own teachers from within. Uh, we've also seen an increase in graduation rates for Black and Latino students over the past three years. Uh, when I started in 2012, those two uh, demographics, uh, graduation rates hovered anywhere between the mid 50th percentile to the low 60th percentile. Now, uh, those two groups for the last three years have hovered anywhere between uh, the high ninth, uh, 70th percentile, pretty much hovering in the mid 80th percentile. But our Latino population, actually, last year, I think their graduation rate spiked to 92 uh, percent. And we've also followed educational research, uh, which says that, you know, the more kids see themselves reflected in the curriculum, it contributes to their academic success. So we have been making curricular changes, uh, really uh, more so at the high school and the middle school to ensure that all students see themselves reflected in their learning. Uh, so, you know, when you have uh, the commitment and the intentionality and, and your organization is pre, uh, creating space for you to engage in some deep learning, it can help you transform and change your systems. Uh, so for as a business community, I think, you know, some things that you can need to consider is to uh, embrace this idea of information gathering. Uh, look at data points within your organization. What does the staffing look like? Uh, what does the, the broader community around Madison and Dane County look like? And, and what does your clientele look like? I think it's important uh, for the private sector as well as the public sector to uh, be intentional to create professional learning opportunities around bias uh, around issues of, of race, around issues of, of gender inequality uh, or, or sexual inequality. Uh, these are conversations that we have to have um, as a changing um, human family. There has to be personal and organization commitment. Uh, the business sector has to be willing to invest and in, in build relationships with communities of color, because as you're building relationships, it'll be very easy for you to dismantle barriers to hiring opportunities. Uh, if you haven't considered this already, I think it would be powerful to partner with local school districts and create job shadowing opportunities, internship opportunities, and, and grow your own opportunities with a focus on uh, filling those, those gaps that may not be reflected in your staff demographics. And if you're intentional and have that commitment, set goals, uh, you know, set short term and long term goals. Uh, the short term goals are your low hanging fruit that, you know, can really, you know, keep you motivated and inspired while you're aiming for those long term goals. And that can look different based on the organization uh, that you represent. And then uh, lastly, you know, having a vision for what you want your culture and climate of the organization to look like, feel like, breathe like. Uh, and, and see like, you know, because that 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 will be so powerful and important in terms of retention. So I think, you know, the first three, four bullet points or the first five are great for uh, recruitment efforts. But then when you get into the hiring process, uh, you just have to make sure that those panels uh, represent a diverse group of people so that you have diverse thought that is uh, that use you your greatest opportunity to be able to confront biases as they exist in those processes. Uh, but then, you know, as far as retention, you know, you have to really uh, do the work to have a culture and climate that embraces diversity uh, and acknowledges the talent and skills that all of your staff bring in, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation or regardless of race. 
So that's all I have for you uh, this afternoon, but I, I really want to open it up for you to, to ask me any questions. Uh, so if there are any thoughts that you're having right now, or if there are any questions that you have, uh, feel free to, to put them into the chat. I know we've, we've got this, uh, you know, live until about one thirty. Uh, so feel free to just throw it out there. I, I, you know, I'm an open book, you know, if you have a brave question, put it in the space. I'm, I'm here to, to answer anything that you may have. First and foremost, I want to thank uh, you, Percy, for putting this together. Um, super uh, informative. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody who took the time uh, throughout their day to, to go ahead and, and, and spend with uh, uh, Percy and myself here on our channel. Um, so for, we've got a question here. This is a lengthy one So from, from Natalie. So uh, she states that she works in education and she works for the Boys and Girls Club with uh, the AVID slash TOPS partnership. I'm working at... I'm working on diversifying our team of coordinators who work alongside teachers directly in Madison's four comprehensive high schools. And we're seeing some similar challenges that you have had uh, with hiring racially diverse teachers. Uh, my goal is to hire our students once they graduate college, but that is a longer term plan. Any recommendations for navigating this challenge in the short term? Yeah, I think that should be a long term commitment for uh any school district, but the short term is to look at what you already have in the system. Uh, and what we've been able to do in Middleton, uh, well, well, first we, sh we shifted some resources. Uh, and if you're familiar with AVID, if you're, if you're at one of the, the high schools, you, you have a position called the Multicultural Services Coordinator position. Uh, I used to work in the Madison School District and I was actually uh, working at Memorial and was part of the the planning team that developed and actually brought AVID into MMSD. So it's good to see that there's somebody working in AVID in the space. Uh, but I think, you know, there are folks in the system. So uh, like I was saying, I shifted, we, the district shifted resources and we created six positions, uh, student, student and family engagement specialist positions that mirror the multicultural services coordinator position. Uh, and all of them have college degrees. So we have six in the system right now and four are actually going through our Grow Your Own Teacher Certification Program. Uh, one of them have already completed the program, so they have their teaching license. And we've also committed resources to identify, uh, you know, staff of color that either have an associate's degree or close to completing a, a bachelor's degree that may be in one of our peer education uh, specialist positions. Uh, we have an application process to get them to support them finishing the bachelor's degree so then they can go ahead and pursue uh, their teaching licensure you know depending on the bachelor's degree it will steer what what certification you can pursue uh so those are those are ways where you can get folks certified you know within a year within 18 months but you know maybe within two years or so for folks that you may have in the system that have college credits towards a bachelor's degree but just haven't finished it but you can wrap all of that in and, and get them into an 18 month program, uh, we, uh, you know, either online or at Edgewood to get them that teaching licensure program. So that's one thing that we're doing in Middleton. Uh, but again, there has to be a commitment and a drive to be able to do that. And you have to be able to allocate resources to make that happen. We were able to shift some of that within our own budget in Middleton but we also have the support of our Ed Foundation uh, that is raising money not only to support our our quick hits with, uh, you know, building teacher capacity from our staff within, but also ensuring that we have enough financial resources to support our kiddos for the long haul to be able to bring our own back into the system. Uh, so those are some ways that uh, we've been creative in Middleton. Uh, but, you know, we also have chicago we have detroit we have you know cincinnati and cleveland and ohio we have minneapolis we also just have to be committed and aggressive to be able to go into more of those urban environments in the midwest to aggressively recruit and what i mean by aggressively recruit is to you know have a standard set of questions and look for us when we go to those places and if we see what we like we offer a conditional contract you know in hand and, and offer a signing bonus uh, we just have to be willing to think outside of the box. You know, we have a new 
business services manager and, and those are things that we're building within into our system right now as we think about uh, an aggressive recruitment plan across the midwest but with a focus on urban environments thank you so much for that percy this next one comes from hannah um so she states we want to and we as in her the company she works for want to diversify our client and customer base uh, but our staff is primarily white do we focus on hiring first um, and outreach to communities of color uh, first or both at the same time. So let me read that again. Do we focus on hiring first, um, outreach to communities of color first or both at the same time? Well, first start with uh, some internal work, um, really trying to understand, you know, what is the mission and vision of your organization, right? Um, who's responsible for hiring? What, what do the hiring panels look like? So you want to really you know, flush out what's happening internally before you think about launching a plan to reach out to the community. Uh, so better understand yourself and then and, and, and getting some foundational learning of, about barriers that have been put in place uh, for certain demographics right here in the Madison area or for whatever clientele base that you're serving. And I think once you do that, then you can start developing an action plan to start reaching out authentically. Um, to engage the community around hiring or or maybe it's channeling, you know, working more closely with school districts. But I think you have to first start with some self-reflection in terms of, you know, what the organization looks like today. Uh, what are some reasons why it may not look the way you want it in terms of staffing? What are some barriers to that? And then what are some things that the organization can commit to in terms of, of reaching out and and if you need some support with that, Hannah, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. But I think, you know, with those things, you can develop that action plan, that that recruitment plan that can be more meaningful because, you know, you better understand your organization. So now once you go out there to to start making those connections, you will be better informed and you can actually have a, a pretty solid strategy. I mean, that's what it was in Middleton. We didn't push hiring right away. You know, for me, uh, really coming in and, and trying to lead the work, I was like, the first thing that we have to do is to educate ourselves to develop the moral imperative, which happened and, and then shifted into us uh, revisioning what we really wanted to do around hiring. And I think as that commitment and intentionality, uh, you know, really solidified, we were able to start making progress in that area. Um, but it was not only that, but then as our work, you know, really started being highlighted across the county. You know, people of color have been applying to our system uh, because they they kind of see what we stand for. Uh, they they see the work that's taking place in terms of what we're trying to do for all children. Like that'll look a little bit different for you, but the more that you can showcase partnerships as you have a strategic plan around what it is that you're trying to accomplish as people see that you're genuine and what it is that you're trying to do, you know, that will capture people's eyes and, and you'll start to see people applying for jobs. But if you got those, those things built in terms of what you're committed to and, and as you start your action plan, once you start getting people through the process, you have to make sure that that process is also fluid and, and is along those lines of being committed to diversifying and just don't hire somebody just because. Um, that 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 doesn't work well either, uh, but you can be intentional and there's a lot of talent out there. There are people of color out there that can get the job done in those industries uh, that may be lacking in diversity. We just have to have a strategy. I hope that helps. She did comment. She said, thank you very much, Percy. Uh, ne next question comes from Mackenzie. Any suggestions for talking with white hiring managers about how to uh, look at and consider those diverse applicants for positions and avoiding bias of selecting folks who look like them, quote unquote. Thank you in advance. They just need to be in spaces like this to at least get some foundational learning if it's not on their radar. Right. Because if it's not on their radar and they're not having conversations about it, you know, it could just be they don't feel comfortable because it's the stereotypes. Right. As the reason why we don't see applicants of color or anything like that. Um, so, you know, education, I think, is just so important today um, as I have paid so close attention to 
you know, the presidential election, um, you know, Trump's position on issues of race, Biden's position on issues of race, uh, how Ice Cube was kind of, you know, interfacing all of this with the contract with Black America, and even, you know, the things that we're seeing, uh, you know, with social unrest because of uh, officer involved shootings or what have you. Like, seriously, I just got done doing a, a training for the Dane County Sheriff's Department. I, I interfaced with all 450 plus people in that department over six weeks. And, and it was really getting to this issue of what we've been seeing on social media a lot. And I had to offer historical context in order for them to be able to, to think about what we're seeing today differently. And, you know, it was tough, right? Uh, you know, they didn't know who I was as a black man coming into the space. And, and, you know, you got the Black Lives Matter movement that has this laser light focus on criminal justice reform and defunding the police. So they didn't know who I was. Um, but I really came into the space to offer perspective and to get them to think critically about what it is that confronts us, you know, respecting the, the, the opinion and the perspective of law enforcement, but also sharing, you know, the perspective and the lived experience of black America. And then just saying, based on this right here, is there room for improvement? around issues of due process and, and policies and protocols that can minimize unfortunate deaths of, of, of black Americans or any American for that matter by the hands of law enforcement. So I think for you know the, the white men that are in managerial positions, I think it starts with education because like I said, in Middleton, although the demographics haven't changed, I mean, have shifted, a lot of the work was able to take off because of white men and leadership. And it was the education uh, that really drove their moral imperative to start shifting uh, some of our practices around hiring, some of our practices around, um, you know, curriculum choices. Uh, so it can be done, but I would say it starts with gathering the information and educating, uh, you know, those folks in management. And I think that creates the conditions for commitment and then once you have that commitment, you will be able to flush out action steps. Percy, great, great uh, learning from you and, and hearing you kind of, uh, you know, share your, your experiences and your insight. Uh, very helpful for a lot of the folks, myself included with this. I think I really enjoyed the idea of, um, you know, working with schools to develop internships for some of those programs. One of the latter parts that you mentioned there. Um, that's all we have for questions. Um, if people want to go ahead and get in contact with you, what would be the best way to do so? Percy at percybrown.org. Percy at percybrown.org. I will go ahead and comment that in the, uh, the comment section here, just so folks have access to that. Um, again, thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, I hope everybody had the opportunity to go out and vote today. I know you shared that at the beginning. Uh, with that being said, we will uh, go ahead and cap it there and we will see you folks next time. All right. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. And actually, uh, now that I've got some time in between sure. in my next meeting, I got to try to vote. <laughs> so I, I'm about to try to head there right now. But yeah, uh, to all the folks that, that were uh, you know hooked in on the live stream, thank you for your time. I hope that you found, uh, you know, the webinar informative and, and hopefully uh, having you thinking critically about what your organization can do moving forward if you see uh, diversity in staffing and hiring as something important. So uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And Andrew, thanks again for the invitation. And hope to see you soon and congrats on that uh, up and coming newborn, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. All right. Have a good rest of your day. All right. You too. Take care. Yeah.